I'm Kevin Hearn, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey. Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Kevin Hearn. Be sure to go over to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. There's handy links in the sidebar where you can subscribe on your favorite uh, podcast uh, app, on your phone, on your computer, wherever you do it. You can find links there. You also uh, find us on YouTube. There's a link in the sidebar as well. I'd like to thank some sponsors who faithfully uh, support the show and allow us to do what we do. George Kramer and his new book, Blind to Blood. Ben Bergstow had a unique job. He was a tissue procurement specialist. When someone died, he would surgically remove people's body parts for donation. He really enjoyed doing it. So much so, when an anonymous email asked him to consider recovering people's body parts on the side, he was more than happy to oblige. The trouble was Ben sought out live people to fulfill his clandestine client's needs. Read all about Ben's exploits in this riveting book that delves into tissue procurement, Blind to Blood by George Kramer. Pick up your copy today on Amazon and find out why people are saying this is an intense page turner, uh, that they are also fascinated by digging into the mind of Ben and finding out how he works. If you would like to see a look into the darker side of humanity, pick up Blind to Blood, the riveting new page turner by George Kramer. Also, I'd like to thank Richard Thomas uh, for sponsoring the show. Richard has uh, an online fiction writer's course at the University of Richard. And uh, there's a link in the show notes. There's a banner uh, there where you can click on and you can see the course guide. Uh, Lots and lots of classes coming up. He can help teach you to be the best writer you can be. Uh, There's classes coming up for the 2018 and 2019 season, like short story mechanics, Writing flash fiction, contemporary dark fiction, advanced creative writing workshops, uh, how to write a novel in a year, lots and lots of stuff from a very uh, prolific and excellent writer, Richard Thomas, teaching you how to be the best writer you can be. It's the University of Richard. There's a link in the show notes. Hey guys, we have a brand new sponsor joining us, and uh, we came in kind of at the last minute, uh, but I wanted to interject something into this episode. We're going to be talking a lot over the next a little bit about Jonathan Yanez and J.R. Castle. Into the Breach is the first book in the Gateway to the Galaxy series. This is one of the most fun science fiction series I think I've read in a long time. Think Green Lantern meets Stargate. Uh, Please go pick up Into the Breach, the first book in the series. I'm going to be telling you lots about it in the coming days as always stay tuned at the end of the show for an audiobook clip from our good friend richard glebes well thanks for joining me again for the author stories podcast where i bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers uh, today i'm really excited to have one of my personal favorite authors on the show today kevin hearn uh, author of the iron druid chronicles uh, he has a new epic fantasy series seven kennings and he's also doing uh kind of an epic fantasy send-up that's coming out uh, this summer uh welcome to the show kevin hey thanks so much hank appreciate you having me i am uh, i'm excited to have you uh before we get started with the the interview proper uh we begin each show with the same question and that question is what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller uh, I was actually in college. Uh, I didn't really get the, the writing bug until I had read a few things in college. And uh, now, so I was age 19 at the time. Before that, I wanted to be a, an artist. Um, and then uh, I kind of shifted my goals there a little bit. But, uh, yeah, I remember that uh, very clearly. I'd been reading a few novels that uh, were a bit, uh, you know, outside of your high school curriculum, I suppose, you know. And uh, and it really kind of inspired me, and I wanted to tell my own stories. 
uh, did I hear somewhere that one of those inspirational uh, or one of those books that was uh, an inspiration for you to start writing was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? Yeah, he did some remarkable stuff with voice there. You kind of read it now, and, and, and it, it winds up having some, you know, it, does, it doesn't necessarily age uh, all that well everywhere, but um, the uh, parts of the voice were really remarkable because you see this very disturbed individual as the narrator gradually get better and his sentence structure improves and so on throughout the book. I thought that was uh, just a really interesting technique, and I wanted to kind of have that magic myself. Right, right. Um, you said that before that you, you wanted to be an artist, a, you mean like a visual artist, a graphic artist? Yeah. I was. A, I used to be a cartoonist, an editorial cartoonist, and uh, I'm pretty good with pen and ink just doing some sketches and things like that. But uh, when it comes to doing paintings and things like that, I, I kind of fall short. So um, I, I wound up uh, switching my major to English and really got into the reading and writing stuff. Nice, nice. Um, as a kid, uh, were you a bookish kid? Did you did you read a lot? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. All those Hardy Boys, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, and Encyclopedia Brown, you know. I used to love all of those little mysteries that they used to crank out. Uh, Beverly Cleary, fantastic as well, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, what was that? Uh, gosh, the Ralph, the motor- motorcycle, uh, Mouse, the motorcycle. Yes, yes. Man, I'll tell you what, I, I, uh, I used to love waiting for the Scholastic Book Fair to come back around just so I could see if there was a new Encyclopedia Brown book coming out. Oh, you betcha. When those, those, uh, yeah, you used to be able to order books uh, through a little order form at the school, and then they'd be you know, delivered to you at the school. It was, it was the best thing. Yeah, kids, before the Internet, that's how we bought books <laughs> uh, when, when you were a kid. <laughs> that's right. Oh, yeah. So you, you uh, switched your major uh, to, uh, to English. Uh, what was your uh, – did you intend to be a writer uh, with that? Or, and, and if so, uh, you know, a lot of us don't just go – you know, as soon as we, we finish college and set out into the world, uh, a, a lot of us don't focus 100% on writing and, you know, hope to write the great novel. Uh, most of us have to go get a day job and uh, pay some bills and start a family and, and all of that sort of stuff. What was your uh, career path? Yeah, it was actually English education. So, yeah, I was I was training to be an English teacher um, so I could just geek out on English forever. So uh, that's what I did. I was an English high school English teacher for 17 years. That uh, That was the day job. And then uh, night job was uh, delivering pizza, and then on the weekends I would, uh, or Friday nights anyway, I would uh, announce the football games. First down and ten at the thirty yard line, etc. When you were teaching uh, English, were you writing, uh, you know, novels on the side? Was that always a desire to uh, to be published? Uh, yeah, I was uh, writing novels uh, from age 19, not finishing them um, for a long time. And then I finally did finish one. It took me six years to finish it, and it was awful. Uh, and then I uh, wrote another one. Uh, and that one was an epic journey or an epic fantasy. And um, after I got finished with that, I tried to sell it. Uh, got a got a nibble on it. And then while I was waiting to hear back on it, uh, I wrote Hounded. So Hounded was my third book, and it took me 11 months, whereas, you know, everything else took me a lot longer. I was getting faster as I went. Yeah. What, uh, what genre was, was that first book? You said the second was epic fantasy. The third, uh, obviously, is urban. What, what was the first one? Well, that's the thing. That, that was the problem with it. It was just this mishmash of, of all this stuff, and I couldn't figure out how to market it. Uh and so if I couldn't write a, a coherent query and all that, that just kind of told you how all over the place it was. Right. Uh, the most important thing I, I learned from it was just that, uh, hey, I can finish a book. It's a terrible book, but I can finish one. And I can learn a lot from all the mistakes I made. And that's what I did. I wrote the epic fantasy, uh, wound up being twice as long and half the time. So <laughs> that was just because I had the confidence that I could finish it, you know? Yeah. Uh, that that was a huge thing, huge uh, obstacle overcome. 
that's really interesting about that first book that you wrote because you know there's a there's a line between uh, genre mashups and and doing something really interesting and new and unique um, and doing something that just has no form and, and it's just all over the place. Um, what do you think separates those two things from being something that's unique and and uh, and, and is you know maybe uh, plowing new ground and something that's just uh, kind of hopelessly scattered. Oh, I think there has to be definitely an artistic vision behind something that's really totally new and different. Um, I wasn't writing something totally new and different. It was that my first book was really full of cliches and, uh, <laughs> it was terrible. Uh, seriously, I just, I cringe to think of how bad it is, but it, what I, you know, what I was doing is just feeling my way through the process of getting something done. And so, yeah, there were a lot of crutches I was leaning on there, and um, it, it was just a mess of, of, of stuff, and it wasn't really a genius uh, vision at all. You know, it, it was definitely uh, no, the latter. It was, it was, uh, it was a mess. So um, maybe someday I will have that amazing artistic vision, but uh, <laughs> and come up with something really, really new. But uh, that first book was certainly not it. <laughs> yeah. uh- you said it took you 11 months to write uh, the first Iron Druid book. Did you have a, a unique vision for that book in the beginning? Uh, what was the inspiration for that book? Well, I was reading a lot of urban fantasy, and there were a lot of things that uh, kind of impacted me there. Um, I, I noticed that there were lots of uh, werewolves and vampires and things like that, and that seemed to be sort of a standard thing that needed to be included uh, in the genre, so I had exactly one vampire in mind, and uh, and then I made I put in some werewolves, but they were also sort of supporting characters, and I thought, why don't we write about a druid? Nobody's really writing about that. So um, I I did a lot of research and uh, had a lot of fun uh, figuring out that the Irish pagan gods were uh, quite interesting, and nobody was really sharing their stories all that much. So uh, it, it sounded like uh, 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 some some semi new ground to uh, kind of bring them to urban fantasy. So, were you a uh, kind of a, a a geek for mythology before that? What, was this something that that you were already thinking about, or did um, uh, because that seemed to be underserved? Then you went to start researching it. Like, I guess what I'm asking is, was this something you were already thinking about, or uh, did did this just become? Uh, the, the right uh, setting and, and plot devices for this book. Uh, yeah, I'd always been a mythology geek in general, um, just as I had to teach it. Um, so there's a lot of my English teacher stuff in there. Uh, there's a running thing about, you know, like Shakespearean quote duels between Atticus and Leif Helgerson. And, uh, you know, little, little jokes like that kind of, uh, you know, my, my takes on modern modernist poetry and so on uh, kind of find themselves um, – you know, scattered throughout the series. But uh, the Irish mythology in particular, I wound up having to, you know, research because I hadn't been very familiar with it myself. And I, I found it to be fascinating stuff. Um, and there were clear influences from both the Greco-Roman and the Norse traditions on the Irish, which, of course, is because, you know, the Vikings were raiding Ireland. You know, there's a lot of that uh, uh, cross-cultural uh, community. Uh, yeah, the cross-cultural communication um, was going on between the Vikings and uh, the Irish. Yeah. So uh, you go really deep uh, in Irish mythology, and you bring characters out, especially in that first book. I mean, you go deep fast. Uh, you you go really deep uh, into Irish mythology, uh, and you bring out characters and, and aspects of the mythology that that you you do not see very often in uh, in a lot of, uh, especially new literature, uh, but characters that, that people have never heard of. Um, it, you know, how much research did you do into Irish mythology, and uh, and what sorts of uh, what sorts of references did you use? Well, I don't think it exists anymore. Um, but at the time that I was researching it, this would have been two thousand and eight. Trinity College in Dublin had the old uh, mythological cycles from the Irish up on their website for free. And uh, there's three basic bodies of Irish myth. There's one that's actually called the mythological cycle. 
Then there's the Fenian cycle, F-E-N-I-A-N, and the Ulster cycle. And those three bodies of, of myth taken together will get you most of, you know, the Irish stories. Um, so I read those and, uh, I do believe those are now on sale in ebook form somewhere out there. If you can search for the names of the cycles, you should find that I was just using uh, Trinity College in Dublin. They had the original Irish on one side of the page and the English translation on the other. Nice. Uh, the the main character in the book, uh, Atticus, uh, or, or you you know Oberon might be the main character. Um, I'm not sure, uh, but um, you know they they make this pair uh, that that are really unique uh, in that Atticus is 2100 years old, this druid uh, who uh, finds himself in the American Southwest, and he's kind of this timeless character that's been through so much, seen so much, experienced so much. And then you have Oberon, uh, his Irish wolfhound, who is really an anchoring, um, uh, you know, quality for uh, for Atticus. Uh, where did the two of those characters come from for you? Well, actually, you you kind of nailed it there. Uh, Oberon is supposed to be an anchoring figure for Atticus, who has such a huge past that he can easily get lost in it. Um, and, and and Oberon always make sure he is paying attention to the present. And that uh, one of the things that I was trying to explore is uh, what happens to us if we do get to live a very long time. So you have the werewolves and the vampires and how they behave. Um, and then you have Atticus and the gods as well. So all of these uh, beings have very long lives and they behave very differently, just like, of course, we do. And that's one of the things that uh, that I was kind of exploring. Do you get better just because you live longer? Or do you still make unwise choices and make mistakes and so on and so forth? And um, I, I thought he would be wiser in some regard you know, and, and maybe just be a little bit cynical about things because he's seen a lot of stuff uh, over and over again. I become somehow – somebody who would not make mistakes or terrible decisions because we certainly see examples of our elders making bad decisions all the time, you know, just read a newspaper, you know? Um, and so you'll see that people are continuing to make bad decisions, you know, later in their lives. So, um, that was one of the things that I was kind of exploring there. And, um, I, I did want to have a, a dog. I just like dogs. Um, and, um, Really, the the idea of having a druid came from the idea that uh, I didn't want to have a wizard or a witch being the human side of the equation because wizards and witches tend to view animals as like familiars, almost a master-servant relationship, which is a vibe I really didn't dig. So I wanted a friend for the dog, and the druid fit that bill a little bit better, and then things kind of developed from there once I started researching things and, you know, making sure it would work. And, uh, yeah, I found in the old Irish mythology this uh, idea that Fragara, the uh, the answerer, um, had been given to Khan of the Hundred Battles back in the first century by the Tua de Danon and was never given back. So that was my entry into the mythology, you know, that was a little space that I could slip my druid in there and, uh, you know, take off running. I love it. Um, a, a lot of what we know uh, about druids in history uh, was written, uh, you know, by by the invaders. And we don't have a, a whole lot um, you know, that was not written by the Romans uh, about what they actually believed in their practices. And we, we put you know, things together throughout history. Um, but what were some, uh, uh, what, what were some things that you, that you could lean on, uh, about the life of, of a Druid and what sort of things did you have to kind of fill in because, um, history is, is, is sometimes, uh, not very forthcoming, uh, about those people. Yeah, they were definitely an oral uh, culture, so uh, right. they didn't write anything down, so we don't have anything in their own words. We only have the words of people who hated them. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, the Romans, the Christians, the, the Greeks came along. Uh, as far as Caesar is concerned, 
I took one fact from Caesar that I figured was just a, a very shiny little fact that he would have no reason to make up. Um, and it was that the Druids had a 12 year training period. Um, I, I didn't, I couldn't think of any reason why he would make that number up, you know, to, to portray them negatively. <laughs> so I thought that that one, that one fact must be true. Right. Um, and then I, though I did kind of discard a lot of what else he said. Um, but then, uh, there were multiple accounts and other, uh, you know, other folks that, that wrote about the Druids saying that they had some power over the weather or they had shape shifting ability or even the ability to teleport. And so since those were spread across multiple sources, I kind of, um, you know, basically said, well, I'm going to pick these then as the, uh, the powers that a Druid would have and kind of developed it from there, developed the magic system really on my own, but based on, you know, the ideas that, uh, that, uh, were kind of given in these multiple sources. Um, I, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but your your new epic fantasy book, A Plague of Giants, uh, you know, you've got this bard who really fills the role of what we think of as as druid, uh, probably, and the the bardic tradition. Uh, you're you're pulling a lot from what you did in in the uh, the Iron Druid, uh, but in a very different way. Uh, are those two things connected uh, for you? Maybe a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I did. Um, I've been wanting to do a bardic sort of story for a long while, uh, not just because of the Druidic tradition, but uh, because of the Homeric tradition. The idea that Homer was using his lyre and his um, heroic couplets and so on to tell the story of the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, a night at a time, um, you know, a chapter at a time for uh, an appreciative audience around a, a fire and uh, with some mead or something around there. So. Um, I thought, well, what would what would that be like if we tried to take that experience and bring it to prose? And uh, that's where we got the structure or where I got the structure for A Plague of Giants and, you know, the Seven Kennings trilogy. It's, it's absolutely mind blowing. Uh, it's uh, it's really unique and innovative. Uh and well, you know, in in today's uh, literature, it seems to be innovative. But you're you're really pulling from that old tradition, um, which just kind of proves, I guess, that there's nothing new under the sun. There's uh, we keep kind of reworking these same traditions, uh, and and old things become new again. Um, but it's really exciting to see it. Uh, when I st I've been listening to the audio book, and it just it, it just got me excited. Uh, so I'm I'm super happy that you're doing that. Um, but the the Iron Druid series to go back to that real quick uh, because the last book just came out uh, about two months ago, and it, there was a nine book series. Uh, that was a, a conscious effort from the beginning for it to be a nine book series, wasn't it? Yes. Well, I at, at the very beginning, I just wanted to to get to book four. You know, I had a three book contract, and I hoped to write <laughs> some more after that. Um, and, and luckily, you know, folks uh, liked it enough and bought enough copies that the publisher was going to go ahead and let me finish my series. So, yeah, nine, uh, nine is such a hugely important number in the Irish uh, mythological uh, cycles. If you go through and read those, you will see that the characters keep doing things in multiples of nine. It takes nine months or nine years or nine weeks or whatever so to do anything important. So um, I figured a figure from that culture would tell his own story in nine books. So that's why I, I, I ended it there. Although of course I've cheated by <laughs> putting in novella <laughs> short stories, right. stuff like that. Uh, I'm still writing an Oberon's meaty mystery that'll come out uh, hopefully later this year uh, that takes place after the events of the last book, but uh, that'll be the last thing I got going for it. Nice. Um, we talked about the, the Irish mythology that, that you go so deep on, uh, you know, in the first books, but you, you really expand the story and start talking about the mythologies and the uh, the pantheons uh, from all over the world. Uh, did was that a uh, something that you wanted to do from the beginning, or is it just as the story grew, um, it, it needed to to move? Uh, how did that come about? Oh, it was a question I asked myself at the very beginning of the you know the the world building for the first book. You know, if I'm going to say that the Irish pantheon is real. I had to ask myself the question, well, if they're real, why aren't all the others real? Right. And then the answer was, well, they're all real. So um, it, it that became instantly a lot of fun. 
Um, and then, of course, we never get around to seeing all of the pantheons or any, you know, by any means. It, it's just, you know, whoever Atticus kind of runs into uh, that we see. But, you know, there's the idea that, you know, that, that they're all out there and all working. We I especially kind of spend a little bit of time talking about how all of the different uh, pantheons and cultures are having their own little wars going on at, in Scourged, the last book. Right. Um, yeah. I come from uh, from the Christian tradition, it, born in 20th century uh, America, and uh-huh. uh, so you know my experience is a is a very particular one. And when I read stories like like the Iron Druid, and, and we get to see all of these different uh, cultures and mythologies, um, those things do not offend me or uh, intimidate me in, in any way. And I'm sure that does some people, I'm sure, I'm sure some people get, you know, their feathers ruffled because you, you know, start poking at their sacred cows or, or whatever. Um, but you know, if you can imagine yourself that, that you were born in a different time in a different place, uh, you know, that this might have been your experience. Um, do you feel like, looking into and researching all of these different cultures and their, their gods and their goddesses and, uh, and their traditions. Um, do you think that has given you more, uh, empathy for other people? Um, not that you, you know, weren't already, but, uh, you know, when you start figuring out how other people live and believe it, it tends to kind of soften you, uh, about maybe where some of your harder edges were. Oh, yeah. Well, I actually studied religions in college a little bit as well. I, I took um, several classes in it as part of my, you know, my degree. And uh, I've always loved them. Um, so I, I always found them, you know, fascinating and comforting. And so um, and hopefully nobody really felt that I was poking fun at them too much at all, uh, I, except for Thor. Um, <laughs> I, I, I was doing my best to, um, you know, be respectful uh, to everybody, of course, because I do appreciate them all. Um, but so, Thor's kind of a dick, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Except for that guy. Thor. <laughs> I, yeah, I do get people asking me like, why, why are you, why do you have it in for Thor? And, and uh, it, it's basically, it, it's not that I do have it in for him. It's, it's only that I, I found out that, or I figured that uh, based on uh, his mythology, he had the greatest chance over time of becoming a sociopath. Um, <laughs> because he, of all the thunder gods, there are so many thunder gods in, in the world. Um, but of all of them, he had the, so he met in, in, in the final battle. And I thought that since he's a uh, kind of an unstable avatar, you know, bad weather to begin with, he does have a temper that, uh, it, once he figured out that he really would not have no consequences for be, his behavior until Ragnarok, that might tend to alter his behavior over time. So, you know, by the time we see him, it's been a thousand years or so since the original sagas and, um, you know, he's had time to, to, to get a little bit sour. So, um, that's what, that was my rationale behind, uh, portraying him that way. I want to take a pause from the show for just a moment to tell you about a sponsor. As a writer, your editor is often the first and last eyes on your work. The best editors are trusted collaborators, bringing your story to life in a way you didn't know was possible. Marlo Moss will take your writing to a new level and your career to new heights, ensuring that readers not only buy your book, but also love reading it too. One top editor calls Marlo Moss a talented author in his own right and as skilled an editor as I've seen. I use the skills myself. One of his authors says, I had no idea my writing could be this good. Tension, POV or timeline issues, plot and pacing, Marlowe does it all and for the price of a copy edit. Your hard work deserves a better editor and Marlowe Moss is the editing partner you've been looking for at a price you can afford. Offering developmental and copy editing as well as beta and proofreaders, visit MarlowMoss.net for more information and a free sample edit. That's M-A-R-L-O-W-M-O-S-S. Dot net and let me tell you I have used Marlo Moss uh, he has edited a story for me and the comments that I got back were eye-opening y- you know as a writer and as someone who spends time with words as much as I do you you tend to gloss over things you just completely lose them because you're so involved 
in creating and you need to step away and let someone else put their eyes on it and help you see the things that you can't see for yourself. Marlo Moss is amazing. M-A-R-L-O-W-M-O-S-S dot net. Um, is there room uh, in this world for more stories about Atticus and, and or Oberon? Um, you know, the, these stories are, are very uh, and because Oberon is a is a grounding force uh, for for Atticus, then these stories need to be in a very particular time and, and place. Uh, but Atticus has lived for twenty one hundred years, uh, I, and I know that this series was supposed to be nine books, and 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 the reasons for that. But is there room for other stories? Um, actually, I, I have a book of short stories called Besieged, where I I do tell some stories from. Atticus's past, um, you know, quite distant past, um, ancient Egypt and things like that. So um, that might uh, and Shakespeare. Uh, yeah, exactly. Shakespeare is in there as well. Um, I've got one uh, set in the uh, the Gold Rush of uh, San Francisco, eighteen forty nine. Um, so yeah, I, I do tell some of these stories that uh, occur before uh, he teamed up with Oberon. And, of course, there's, you know, the potential to, to tell more, should I wish to, down the road. But at the moment, um, the last thing I'm doing is the Oberon's Meaty Mystery I'm writing right now. Gotcha. Um, the uh, the Iron Druid series, the uh, Atticus's stories, uh, is is urban fantasy. We're, we're dealing with all of these fantasy uh, tropes in a, in a modern setting. Uh, your new series uh, with the Plague of Giants uh, being the first one is a traditional epic fantasy. Uh, do you enjoy writing one or the other of those? Uh, and is, is it? Uh, do you have to use different writers' muscles uh, for those different genres? Oh, I do. Yeah, um, I do. It, they're very different experiences for sure. Um, I, I can write the urban fantasy pretty easily at this point. Um, and, uh, you know, progress quite fast. I, I, I am able to write one of those novels in four or five months now, but, uh, the epic fantasies take longer. They, they're longer books to begin with, but you also really have to immerse yourself in that world and, uh, kind of, um, to the exclusion of almost everything else at that point. So, uh, it, it you know, I'm trying to write the sequel to the Plague of Giants right now, and it, it's taking... Uh, it takes me some time to uh, immerse myself in the world again. Um, and if I get distracted by having to do a different project, then I have to, you know, basically reacquaint with myself with the world all over, you know, again, it's very time consuming. So um, I'm uh, hoping to get done by the end of the year on the sequel and uh, have a, a release date for that soon afterward. Um, but I do find that, that they're very different and I like both of them for different reasons. Uh, urban fantasy is just sheer fun, um, but uh, epic fantasy is you know kind of the mountain I wanted to climb, and I'm I'm really proud of of uh, what I'm doing there, um, in general. Is the world building uh, the the harder part of epic fantasy? Because uh, with with urban fantasy, there's you're dealing with familiar things uh, to a modern audience. There's there's very little. Uh, that you really have to fill them in on. Uh, but when you're dealing with epic fantasy, you're literally building the world from the ground up. Is that, uh, is that where the challenge lies? Uh, and, and is that why epic fantasy tends to be bigger and kind of more in depth? Yeah, I, I do believe that. Yeah. The world building is a huge deal. Uh, you have to figure out economic systems and so on and so forth. And you know, how many, uh, folks, does it take to support a city? Uh, because it's quite a bit. And uh, there, there's a, a great book by Diana Wynn Jones called to- A Tour of Fantasyland or something like that. And uh, it, it kind of makes fun of uh, all the tropes of fantasy um, and, and points out the, the glaring uh, omissions sometimes in economies and so on and so forth uh, that you will see in a lot of fantasy books. So. Uh, I kind of wrote that and like, okay, I need to make sure I address this. <laughs> it's pretty fun. Uh, it, it's very time consuming, but very rewarding when you get done. Yeah. 
Well, as a uh, as readers, why do you think we love these fantasy stories so much? And and you started as a fan yourself. Um, you know, why do we like to get lost in these other worlds, or why do we like to read these stories, these these urban fantasy stories? That uh, is it because the world uh, we live in, we we don't want to admit that uh, that we just live in a mundane world. We want there to be more behind the scenes than than we realize. That might be part of it for sure. Uh, I think that fantasy's uh, role is often to, A, help us escape whatever is bugging us here, but also uh, to help us imagine uh, a better world. Um, that, you know, how we could, uh, or, or, and sometimes it's a warning, right? How, how can we not go down this particular path? Uh, let's not make that mistake, please. Um, so uh, I, I think it does fulfill a crucial role to help us think about uh, the problems our current world has and um, how we can perhaps address them uh, going forward. Well, speaking of that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, first time fantasy writers make the mistake of writing kind of social issues in our world that are going on right now or things that the writer is passionate about. And it's it's barely disguised uh you know and in as these these other creatures or, or whatever um what are some things that you have to watch out for pitfalls if you will uh as a fantasy writer so that it just doesn't become trite and it doesn't uh become preachy uh and just a, a barely disguised uh rant about what bugs you about the world um, I, I think it all has to, uh, to come down to characters' agency and what they really care about and more than what you personally care about as an author. Um, it, it is certainly uh, – there is a danger of, of looking at some things and saying, well, because a character has said this, that must be what the author also thinks. Um, that's not true at all. Sometimes we have uh, characters that act and say and do things that we would never, ever do. Um, as authors. So um, I, I, I think in terms of uh, what, well, have a list of things to avoid necessarily is, is just to make sure that the, the characters are, are behaving true to themselves and not to what I personally would do. Right. Right. Uh, some friends of our, uh, some friends and I have been uh, reading through, some older classic fantasy and, uh, and, and looking at, at, uh, maybe how the genre has changed and, uh, and things like that. Um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, fantasy felt, uh, very Tolkien esque. You know, there was, there was a lot of build up uh, before anything really happened. Uh, you know, I, I talked to Terry Brooks about this a, a, a while back and, you know, that first Shannara book, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of setup before anything really happens. And we talked about, you know, it would be very difficult to tell that kind of story now, um, because of what readers expect. And, and, uh, what do you think about kind of the state of fantasy and, and the types of things, uh, that are really engaging readers and staying current with, uh, with telling a modern fantasy story? I think uh, we're kind of living in a, a golden age, honestly, of both science fiction and fantasy. We're, we're seeing some amazing stories being told by folks and more and more, uh, you know, diverse voices being heard out there, which is fantastic. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I, th I think that uh, I, I'm, in, I'm seeing more original stuff and just kind of brilliant, you know, mind-blowing um work now than I ever re recall reading as a kid, which did become a little bit, you know, repetitive, I guess, right. would might be the word. You, you see some of the same patterns over and over. Sure. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very – boy uh, who has been chosen, um, to, you know, to, to take over or, or upset the status quo – um, in fact, we wound up making fun of that quite a bit, um, Delilah Dawson. And I. So um, I, I'm, I'm very glad to, to see all of these new stories, and uh, it's an exciting time to be reading. Well, speaking of, of that book that Delilah Dawson and you did, uh, Kill the Farm Boy, it's coming out later this summer. Um, this seems to be uh, 
a, a kind of a send up of kind of poking fun at, at what we uh, what we've come to expect. Uh, what was your what was your motivation for that book other than just to have a little fun uh, with with the genre? Well, Delilah and I had a signing event together in Dallas a couple of years ago, and we were we had a flight. Uh, our flight out of Dallas was about the same time. So we're sitting at the Dallas airport, and uh, we're, we're just kind of talking about anthology ideas and stuff like that. Um, and I said, hey, you know, what we should do is kill the farm boy because that kid keeps going around and messing everything up. And it's the same, you know, it's basically a white male power fantasy, and you keep seeing it over and over and over again. And uh, so why don't we make fun of that, you know, and just kill that kid? And uh, it, we, the anthology never wound up going anywhere, but Delilah a year later said, why don't we just write that book together ourselves? And so we did, and it turned out to be tremendous fun. And uh, we're taking shots at the Chosen One story and a whole lot of, of different fantasy tropes. And so we have three of those books coming out. They're called The Tales of Pell. And uh, the Pell is the world, P-E-L-L. -L. And you can go to talesofpell.com and you can explore things there. It's a lot of fun. So our second book will be uh, No Country for Old Gnomes. And the third book, we'll, uh, we're writing the third book right now. It's called The Princess Beard. So we'll have a, a time with those two. That's amazing. Um, well, that brings up a great question because I think a lot of people think that fantasy uh, is defined by its tropes and that uh, that you need to have a chosen one. You need to have the farm boy who you know has an, another life that he doesn't know about. And there needs to be a wizard and there, there needs to be um, you know a mentor along the way. And and we think that those things define fantasy when. They're just tools that the writer uses and sometimes crutches. Um, so what defines a fantasy story if it's not these things that we can so easily poke fun at? Oh, man. Um, gosh, definitions are never my, my, my forte. But, uh, <laughs> uh, well, maybe I, not I, definition, but w what is it that makes uh, – is it just this, uh, this escapism? Do, do we need to adhere to certain rules – um, for the genre, uh, what do you think? Well, I think there's, you know, for fantasy, you need to have some sense of magic system going on there. Um, and, uh, hopefully one that, that has some rules to it and doesn't keep changing, um, you know, throughout, for, you know, from story to story. But, um, there's usually a quest involved. It doesn't have to be the heroic quest. There's, uh, different kinds of quest structures out there now. Um, the, and I, I, I'm enjoying seeing some of these new, um, this, I think that the heroine's journey instead of the hero's journey uh, is one that's uh, recently emerged. And then we also have uh, better representation and things like that. I, I'm so happy to see, uh, the, and I seek those stories out. Um, and I, I think that uh, if you have some magic going on in there, you're, you're, you're almost pretty much guaranteed to be, you know, classified as fantasy or at least magical realism, I suppose would be the other one, uh, the genre that you might get marketed as. Uh, and, and beyond that, I don't think writers need to feel beholden to much else. Yeah. Um, speaking of, of magic systems, uh, is there anything that you use to create magic, uh, in your worlds? And, uh, are there, uh, do you draw from any influences or anything when you're designing a magic system? Uh, well, for, for the Iron Druid stuff, it was a very simple concept of just being bound to Gaia. And then, you know, you can either bind or unbind things. Um, and all of your, all of his spells were basically. Um, for the seven kennings, it's more of an elemental sort of magic, but with a huge cost to it. Anyone can become a magic user. However, getting access to that magic is, uh, you know, often a literal leap of faith and uh, could be fatal. So uh, if they survive the experience of seeking a kenning, then, you know, they have power. But uh, they're always a little bit mistrusted because you had to be, you know, borderline suicidal to go after it. And uh, if you use it too much, uh, you really tap into that power. It ages you super quickly. 
So uh, you will have access to power, but you won't have access to it for long. Uh, so those are uh, the two magic systems I got going right now. Uh, in the Iron Druid series, we uh, we have a uh, use a first person uh, narrative that is uh, you know you kind of come to expect that in a lot of uh, urban fantasy. It feels very natural, very comfortable for the reader. Uh, in the Seven Kinnings, in, in a place for giants, you use this really really unique uh, narrative structure uh, that. Uh, and I read a couple of reviews on Amazon, and and a couple of people really didn't get it and and i think they will if they stick with it uh but what i also saw was a lot of people that were really excited to see um the way you did this and i i want to let you tell what it is um but how did you decide to come up with this uh this narrative structure for that book oh gosh well, it was it was definitely a so what we're talking about here is eleven different first person points of view, and that is how it's told. And the bard will inhabit these other voices. Uh, that's kind of his his kenning is the ability to take on the seeming of these other characters, speak in their voices, and even appear uh, the way they appeared in life. And uh, that way they're able to tell the story. But in doing so, what he's doing is is jumping back and forth in time. So we have 11 first-person points of view. So you're head hopping, but you're also uh, jumping to the past and then coming into the present. And the series continues to move closer and closer to the present day until, you know, eventually in the third book, everything will be in the present day. So um, that that is a, a structure that... Uh, took a little while to arrive at. I tried a couple of different things that didn't work out so well. Uh, I was trying epistolary stuff to begin with, and it just wasn't moving quick enough. Um, and then I, I hit upon this, and once I did it and, and um, showed it to my editor, she's like, yep, yep, that's it. You need to go with this. And, uh, and it you know went from there. So it, it wound up uh, – I, I had like a 24-page edit letter from her on that book. <laughs> And it took three and a half months to fix everything, you know. It was so detailed. Uh, my editor, Trisha Narwani, is brilliant. Um, but once I did it, I did everything she asked, and then, it, you know, it was accepted, uh, you know, after that with no further revision. Um, it was a lot of rearranging, and I, I, the first draft had 13 points of view, so I cut out two. So uh, that required a whole lot of rewriting and uh, rearranging to make it work and, uh, but we got it done. And then, uh, writing the sequel, I'm, I'm planning on having 12 points of view. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and, and coming up with the different voices for them is, is always a, a linguistic challenge and, uh, for me and, and, uh, a lot of fun as well. So, um, ho- I, since you're listening to the audiobook, hopefully you are hearing that they have very different patterns of language and so on. And, um, yeah, yes, been- and, and I, I also have the um, uh, have the hardback ordered, and I can't wait to to kind of flip through and and see because a, a lot of times it, with the audio book you you are influenced by the narrator, and the narrator's doing some of that heavy lifting for you. Um, that uh, so I'm really interesting to interested to read through it and 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 see how you you know how you did it with the prose. Um, that doesn't sound right, but I think you know what I'm saying. Um, I do. Yeah, uh, the the hard pap, uh, I'm sorry, not the hardcover is uh, very cool because there are some illustrations in the front to help you uh, keep the character straight as well. Uh, and I worked with the illustrator on that to make them kind of look the way I had it envisioned in my head, and I, I think they're they're lovely. So, uh, uh, that's you- so awesome. Um, so you uh, you. Uh, are no longer teaching school. Um, you are, your writing schedule is so packed. You've got so much coming out. Uh, what is a, a writer's day for you? What's your day oh, look like? Well, uh, part of the day is emails. Um, I've got to do a social media thing every day. You know, I've got to post something on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram every day, at least one thing. Um, and then, <laughs> uh, once I get done with that, um, I am able to, uh, you know, get down to the actual writing or editing or, you know, whatever it is I have to do. Um, and then uh, recently I've uh, gone into this thing called contextual zoning. Uh, I used to be all over the place and some days were more effective than others. 
Uh, but I've been more consistent recently by doing this contextual thing where you kind of train your brain to be in a certain space with a certain sound and light environment. And because you're in the same context, your brain doesn't have to really settle into work mode. It instantly flips there because it recognizes the environment. And because the environment is the same every time, it doesn't require an adjustment period, which is what happens when you go to a coffee shop or something like that. You go to a coffee shop and you're distracted for a while, getting your stuff yourself arranged and um, you know looking around, and, and, and your brain has to settle down before you can actually start working. So by establishing a contextual zone for work, you get rid of that adjustment period and you're spending more time on task and I'm more productive, more consistently by doing that than I used to be. So I'm super happy about that. We see, and and people make fun of writers for being superstitious, you know, that I need to be at a certain place in a, a certain atmosphere to write. And you just proved with science uh, that we are not superstitious idiots. Yeah, there's a tiny bit of science behind it. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's some actual neuroscience behind what our brains do and, and, and how um, – we, we wind up, uh, you know, what's the most effective work environment? And uh, part of the context is, if, you know, if you don't mind me expanding just a tiny bit. Yeah, no, go ahead. Light, yeah, the lighting should be blue or white light because that is the most active sort of uh, lighting environment for you. If you have warm lights like red or yellow, it tends to put you to sleep. So uh, white lights is uh, in my office here. And then I use white noise for – the background. So I actually go to Spotify and I type in rain sounds and I listen to rain. Like there's a whole playlist there of just rain sounds. And I, I listen to that while I am um, composing and it, it really helps. Wow. I, uh, where I live, we can just look out the window and see rain uh, just about every day. So, but, but you live in the desert. So Spotify to the rescue. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Um, do you have any particular software or anything that you are very particular about, or are you just a basic word processor guy? A uh, word processor or, you know, Microsoft Word for the Iron Druid or the Urban Fantasy stuff, but I have to use Scrivener for the epics because of their complexity and the, you know, the necessity to move different narrators around. So I have a little folder for each scene of each narrator and, um, it, yeah, I've got a whole system down for that, and, and I don't. I basically don't think Plague of Giants would have even been possible in Microsoft Word. It just wow. would have. It would not have been doable uh, because it's so. Uh, the amount of moving around I had to do on the edits for that thing would have driven me insane if I was trying to do it in Word, where you're sitting there copying and cutting and pasting. And, oh my god, that would yeah. that would forever. So yeah, that would have been a nightmare. Um, so, so you've got a lot of new releases out. Uh, the uh, the last Iron Druid uh, book, Scourged, is out now in in hardback. Uh, you've got uh, the uh, Plague of Giants uh, that is out gets out in the fall. Did did I hear you say earlier that that's coming out in paperback soon? Yeah, it should be out in paperback this month. So, if folks wanted to pre order it uh, and uh, you know get that for cheaper than the hardcover. Price, you should be able to be able to you know to try that really quickly uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. and then kill the farm boy uh, the the book you did with Delilah S. Dawson uh, the, the the fun send up romp of of our uh, you know trusted fantasy tropes is coming out later this summer in, in July I think yeah July seventeenth that'll be out and we'll have a, a smallish little tour there we'll be in Phoenix San Diego and then I think Naperville Illinois Asheville North Carolina. And uh, Woodstock, Georgia, which is a little bit north of uh, Atlanta. Awesome. Awesome. So we have lots to look forward to from Kevin Hearn uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, Kevin, now that uh, the Iron Druid is, is uh, wrapped up, in essence, uh, I know you've got some other small things you're working on, uh, and Plague of Giants is, is in full swing, uh, what's coming up next for you uh, after these releases we just talked about? Yeah, I I'm, I'm have to finish up the Seven Kennings trilogy. Um, then I also have to finish up this trilogy with Delilah. And then um, I can't really talk about it yet, but there will probably be a spinoff. Uh, uh, I can't give you any details, but a, a, a spinoff uh, series uh, set in the Iron Druid universe. Uh, coming to the road. So uh, that will be the next project after doing the, the trilogy and the uh, 
you know, the tales of Pell with the line. Nice. Um, I I know you're a, a, a comics fan. Are we going to see a comic adaptation of uh, the Iron Druid? Oh, hey, thanks for bringing that up. Hi, I I keep forgetting. Uh, it, it's out. I actually have a comics adaptation. It came out uh, a couple days ago on May 30th. Uh, nice. Yeah, Hounded number one is out now. They are uh, they're they're doing a really good job in the artwork with this, um, and. I think they're going to do issues one through five, you know, and collect it as a novel or, you know, as a, as a you know, graphic novel. And then they'll do uh, issue six through ten. And that will get the entire novel adapted. And uh, I approve the scripts and the art. And uh, it, it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, some of the art's just blowing me away. Like this, the shot of Atticus as an otter going down to get Laksha's <laughs> necklace. You know, yes, I, I, I love it. It's done, you know. Oh, so, that's going to be so fun. Well, yeah, I'm, so far- now, if they want to, yeah, I'm I'm gonna go uh, hunt one down. Uh, I I knew they were coming out soon. I'd heard some talk, but I didn't realize that it was out now. So that's exciting news for me. Um, does Does Atticus look like he does on the covers of these books in the comic? A little bit. Uh, there's a little bit of variation, which is cool with me. Um, the the hair kind of uh, changes a tiny bit here and there. Uh, but yeah, he he's got the you know trademark soul patch thing in bobber he's got going on there. <laughs> I talked to them a lot about how to do the the tattoos, um, so they were very uh, cool to you know get those correct. Um, and uh, yeah, I think folks are gonna like uh, like seeing that quite a bit. The, they've done a fantastic job. I kind of squeed when I first saw the sisters of the three auroras all drawn you know at once you know the thirteen of them. Uh, that was pretty cool, um, and I I really enjoy seeing the the comic version of Hal Hauk and Leif Erikson and you know all that good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kevin, it it has been such a joy to talk to you. I'm I'm a huge fan, and uh, I I know a lot of people listening are as well. Um, where can people find you online if they want to follow along with everything that you're doing? Um, if people are just discovering you right now, there is a wealth. Uh, of stuff out there for them to dive headlong into. Uh, so where can they find you and uh, and connect with you? Well, KevinHearn.com is uh, the one for all of my uh, Iron Druid and uh, you know, Plague of Giant stuff. If you want to go to TalesOfPell.com, that will be the website uh, you know held in common between me and, and Delilah. And there's a lot of fun stuff there. Um, and then uh, on... Twitter and Instagram. I'm just at Kevin Hearn, all one word with the H E A R N E. Uh, and on Instagram, it's kind of fun because I, uh, I'm doing a serial fiction story there, um, you know, about squatch hunting uh, with a guy named Avery. So folks might enjoy that. Uh, and then uh, on Facebook, I, I have a, an author page there as well. If folks want to find me there. It's uh, facebook.com slash author Kevin. And that will get you to my page there. So. Uh, that's what I'm Thank you. And uh, and when you go to Kevin's website, be sure to use the E because there is a Kevin Hearn without the E, and he is not this Kevin Hearn. Yeah, there's not. Yeah, yeah there's a Kevin Hearn who's the. He's a photographer, the, I think. Yeah, there's that. There's also the the bare naked ladies musician. He's in the band. Oh, nice. So, well, I usually get email intended for him. <laughs> yeah, it's been one week since I saw him. <laughs> no. <laughs> that was a really that's bad. There, yeah. yeah, it was really bad. But you know, I went for it, so that's uh, that's that's what matters. Um, Kevin, thanks so much for taking time to come on the show today. It was my pleasure, Hank. I appreciate you having me. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com dot com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleave's The Jason Crane Series. They sat in silence, leaning on spook rock. It pulsed against his back, in rhythm with his heart. He fought an urge to press his palms to it and steal its mysteries. Kate took her hand away. This fundraiser for my father's campaign, was it your idea? No. I didn't think so. You need to watch out. For what? She stood and paced, hands in pockets, avoiding his eyes. Right now, you're a free agent. Nobody knows what you can do except me and Joey. That's rare. You've got space to find your own path, without everybody watching you or controlling you. How many of them, us, are there? 
a few handfuls of families. We used to be all over, but we're kind of dying out. The secrecy issue makes it hard for us to find each other, hard to find people to marry and the like. So we congregate in a few obvious places. Salem, Sleepy Hollow, Transylvania? Don't be stupid. There's no monsters, just people. And ghosts. Ghosts are people. They were. She held her arms out. That's all there is. People in the spirit world. And places in between. Magic places. Haunted places. Like this. We gravitate to towns where we can stick together. It sounds nice. It can be smothering. We have factions. Not all of us want to get by in peace. Some of us, my father is one, say we need to be more aggressive. Increase our numbers. Take charge of things. Politics, finance. Fix the world. People listen. They think they're special. They don't call themselves the gifted. They call themselves the appointed. As if God singled them out to rule. My dad's a good man. He just thinks he knows what's best for everybody. And you'll be meeting his crowd. At the fundraiser. It will be mixed. Mostly normals. But I'll point out the dangerous ones. My father employs a man named Mather. You can't miss him. He has purple eyes. Mather is like this rock. He'll be able to sense you. If you want to stay a free agent, you'll need to avoid him. Or else what? They'll want to recruit me? You're Ichabod's descendant. Ichabod was attacked and survived, a potential founder. They're already watching you. I'm no good to anyone. You don't believe that. Neither do I. She knelt and pushed the hair out of his eyes. What am I going to do with you, Jason Crane? Love me, he thought. He felt himself lean forward. They would kiss, here in this sacred place, beneath the stars. Stars? Stars? What time is it? Jason jumped to his feet. We need to go. Why? A firefly swept the air, flared yellow-green, and died. What's wrong? She followed his gaze and gasped. Fireflies swam in every dark crevasse. Faces coalesced where the lights hovered. Faces of crones and young boys and stern men. Emaciated, hale, wounded, vacant, menacing, piteous. Bodies took form. Military uniforms, bonnets, black lace, crepe, shrouds, winding sheets. Sleepy Hollow Cemetery had disgorged its dead, and that grand army of spirits now made camp at Spook Rock to await orders from their leader. A laugh chopped the wood of the forest. Jason had heard that laugh before. He squeezed Kate's hand. Run, 